Hello, Kingston. I'd like to start by asking you a question and to shout out the answers to me. What do you think the future of human well-being depends on? Ourselves? Wow. Health? When I, it, brilliant. Food? Kindness? Love? Kindness, love. Chocolate! <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> You're, you're a brilliant audience. When I tested this out uh, last week, the first answer I got was Wi-Fi, and the second was Manchester United. <laughs> Which, who knew the future of the planet is dependent on Manchester United? But actually, I think we're in a time where we have to be really mindful of what the future of human well-being does depend on. And I think it's quite simple. I think we can summarize it in two ways. It's if you like, on the one hand, the human rights project of the 20th century, all of the basic human needs that every country in the world agrees everyone on the planet has a right to, some of the things that you spoke about, food, health, water, shelter, protection, security. But on the other hand, on the other side of the equation is the blue planet we're all lucky enough to live on. And that's about thriving ecosystems, healthy soils, healthy oceans, about our healthy atmosphere. And we're only just beginning to understand these days how interconnected those two things are. And on the one hand, we're still in undershoot when it comes to delivering on the Human Rights Project in many countries in the world. And we're in overshoot when it comes to our planetary boundary, particularly around carbon dioxide in the air and healthy soils. And I've always worked in business, and I'm a passionate believer in business as a force for good. But at the moment, in terms of how we view business and how we view work, there's a bit of a fly in the ointment around getting business behind working on this great equation that is probably the generational challenge that we all face. And once you start digging into statistics, around the future of work, you start to come up very quickly with statistics that show us that 63% of us are disengaged with work. That's two out of three people that hate their jobs, 50% of people who have a bad relationship with their manager, and that's 50% of people, don't have any trust or respect in the company that they work for. Now, how are we going to get business behind some of the grand challenges that we face if two out of three of us hate our jobs? And when you start to look at what is behind these statistics, there are, there are complex reasons, but there are two things that stand out. And the first is that organizational hierarchies and management systems that we designed in the 20th century when there were many fewer people with good educations and more people doing menial basic tasks aren't really fit for purpose in the 21st century. They don't allow people to self-actualize. They don't allow people to access those more mature human needs that we have, like purpose like meaning, like wanting to work with integrity, like wanting to be honest, decent people. And the other side, sometimes, it, the organizational structures do, it's a bit like if you're squeezing an orange. You're hoping for a glass of Tropicana, but what you get out are the pips, the, the dark side of human behavior, like anger, distrust, greed, which we've recently seen in companies like Carillion. And while I was researching the qualities that business leaders and organizations might need in the future, I inadvertently came across three different types of companies that are trying in their very different ways to deal with the different levels of disengagement that we have. And the first kind of company is redesigning the creativity and autonomy through shape. You might have heard of these types of companies under the title of holacracy or sociocracy or teal, but for the purposes of today, we'll call them self-managed businesses. And I'd like to introduce you to a company that's based on the south coast of Dorset in Poole called Matt Black Systems. 
Matte black systems um, produce the, the guidance systems that go in the vast majority of the enormous planes that fly very regularly over our heads in Kingston. And when I was interviewing them, I did ask if it was possible to engineer in a little divert. Um, but apparently, it's not possible, and it would be illegal if it was. Um, but seven years ago, Matt Black Systems was a company that was in trouble. Although they had great relationships with their customers, they were always late. They were late 83% of the time, not one week, not two weeks, but sometimes eight months. And the people who ran the company, lovely couple that you can see uh, behind me, had tried absolutely everything that they could. They had tried expensive management consultants. They tried hotshot MBA graduates. They tried um, reorganizing the company based around agile systems, but literally nothing had changed the dial on productivity for the company. And just as they were about to completely give up, they noticed one thing, that in all the upheaval had stayed consistent. And that was the fact that they always had a backlog of work and that their engineers were always being paid overtime. Now, this might sound really simple, but when you're an engineer, you don't look at this sort of data. So they thought they'd try one last experiment, and that was to ban overtime, which, as you can imagine, went down like a dog poo sandwich. <laughs> but they said to all of their employees that they would still be able to earn the same amount of money but there would be a bonus for finishing work on time. And they'd try this for six months. So very reluctantly, the engineers got behind it. And at the end of the first month, one person finishes work on time and went home. At the end of three months, 50% of people finished their work on time and went home. And at the end of six months, there was only one person who was still coming into work late, and he was going through a messy divorce, and he just wanted to escape his wife. <laughs> and productivity had gone up by 20%. And this encouraged the team at Matt Black Systems to try self-management very seriously. So they set up a first experiment with just one team, and they gave them responsibility for purchasing and profit and loss. And it didn't go too well at first when a truck turned up outside the door with a million pounds worth of component parts on it that they neither needed or could use, because one of the engineers had got very excited and carried away with his newfound power. He then had to practice his negotiating skills to get the company he bought it from to take it back. But productivity went up. They then turned the company all into, all into teams, and they gave them total responsibility to go out and get their customers for the HR function, for profitability, for performance, for how they worked amongst each other, for the roles that they did. And productivity went up again. They then decided to go the whole hog and give them responsibility for their own salaries because they knew by now how much money they were making and whether they were losing money, so they knew what they could afford. And then they gave them responsibility for their own time. Come into work if you want between midnight and 3 a.m. in the morning, if it suits you. Take four months off if you'd like. Work only for eight months. As long as it doesn't compromise the team agreement, you can do what you like. And productivity went through the roof. By the end of a five-year period of doing all of these experiments, they had reduced their staff by two-thirds. They'd reduced their cost by half, and they had upped their productivity and profitability 300%. And they were the best supplier in the business. But it wasn't without pain. The people who simply didn't want to step up and do sales, who would rather stick red-hot needles in their eyes than have responsibility for the profit and loss of the business, left the company. And in all of the self-managed companies that I interviewed, and they're not all small, some are large, like W.L. Gore, who make Gore-Tex, that I'm sure you're familiar with, those people left the company. And the compassionate, kind individual in me wanted to explore whether it was possible to find types of companies that could not only support people who didn't feel that they could step up, who didn't have the confidence to, to, to be sales representatives of their company, that could help them with their psychological insecurities and psychological development. And if for no other reason, even if you weren't a compassionate person, you really don't want a bunch of disgruntled egotists that are unemployed wandering around, because you never know, one might take it into their head to apply for a job, like president. 
Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Just had to get it in there somewhere. So the second kind of company that I went looking for are companies that are really dedicating themselves to developing the level of consciousness of the people that are working, for, working with them. And to do that, they have to do two really important things. They have to shine the light onto our weaknesses. And they have to make weaknesses normal. And so you have to start by having a very deep psychological profile of everybody that works for you, that goes way beyond normal psychometrics or even um, DISC or Strengths Finder profiling. You have to really tap into the subconscious drivers and desires of individuals. And I'm going to talk to you through what I did in my company um, because I'm not the sort of person who's terribly touchy-feely and when I decided that I would expose my psychological history and background to all of the members of my team, I genuinely really wanted to hit myself around the head with a brick. But, um, but we began. We started doing the work and you have to start with a deep profile of each individual. So everybody in my company knows that on the good side, um, I'm very good when it comes to service to others, with purpose, with meaningful work. I'm very good in a crisis. I'm very good when it comes to mental resilience. I'm a great problem solver. But they also know that I have real deep issues with trust, with control, with listening to people, with, uh, with a very, very incredibly long list of things. They know why I have those challenges. They know where they came from. And so when everybody inside your company knows the inside out of your history and your life, what you can do is put in a series of practices that help you practice those weaknesses. So these kind of companies turn from performance orientation to practice-based organizations. You get to practice being a better human, if you like. So one of my key practices, because in my long list of failings, was empathy, uh, compassion for others, impatience, <laughs> all sorts of other things. I started by doing something called an empathy walk. And an empathy walk is where you pick people who are completely different to you, have different views, different values, different backgrounds, and you commit to walking with them for an hour, maybe two hours, and listening to their story. Um, I started off doing them once a week. I'm down to once a month now, so I am improving. Um, and one that I did last week was with a farmer who believes deeply and passionately in the future of industrial farming and pesticides and fertilizer and all those kind of things. And I am somebody who believes that if I met the devil in person tomorrow, he would probably have glyphosate tattooed on his forehead and Monsanto tattooed on his chest. <laughs> so that was quite a struggle for me to do that one. We also have practices like talking partners. Has anyone ever heard of talking partners? Where you have somebody, again, who's diametrically opposed to you, and the first thing that you do in the morning when you come in is you talk about what's going on for you outside of work. Trouble with the kids, problem with the husband, beloved dog is about to go over the rainbow bridge. And the way that in doing that, that gets rid of the fears and the tensions and insecurities about what's going on outside work. And then you talk about work, maybe for five or ten minutes. And it's the civic duty of everybody in the company to push the other partner for greatness. So my talking partner, for example, is not going to say to me, yeah, Jenny, your TED Talk's great. They're far more likely to say, Jenny, this is crap, work a little bit harder. Try again, this is not quite good enough. And push, we push ourselves for greatness. We also have a practice called talking circles where when we have learned something about our weaknesses, so if I have managed to get over my impatience with somebody who doesn't go quite as fast as me, we'll sit down in a circle together and once a week we'll talk about how we've overcome different challenges that we faced and we'll film them. 
and we'll put them onto a website that's available for anyone who ever joins the company so they can see if they have had a problem with the fear of speaking in public, how somebody overcame that. Companies like Google, like Atlassian, who make Trello, any Trello users in the house? Yeah? Um, they've taken this a step further because they're way bigger than my company is, and they've automated these processes so that instead of now having the painful, horrible annual review where everybody gets terribly tense and your manager, if you happen to have a not-so-good manager, uses it as an opportunity to point out what your weaknesses have been all year, you can now just simply use an app. You can tick. Did we do well as a team? Are we open? Are we sharing? Are we trusting? And it's open completely to everybody inside the company so that you can work and you can practice all of these kind of normal hiding behaviors that we would all like to get away from. So that's two types of companies. The first one that redesigns, for, redesigns its shape for um, to release creativity, to release innovation, to release self-responsibility. The second kind of company that helps with psychological safety and psychological soul development. But to come back to the beginning where I started, that's not necessarily going to help us with the grand challenges that we face. So we need one more type of company. And those are companies that design for planetary purpose. Not just purpose, not any old purpose, but planetary purpose. And to help us do that, we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them, that neatly encapsulate all of the basic human needs that we talked about earlier. And what we need, not just existing companies, but all startup organizations to do, is sit and look very carefully at all of these goals and ask, all of the stakeholders, all of the staff in the organization, activating all of the con collective intelligence inside the organization, a simple question, what do you care about? And when you work out what people care about, then you map it to what your company does and where your company can have an impact. To give you an example, Let's think about the humble condom. There is a father and daughter combination in the States that have set up a company called Sustain, Sustain Condoms. He is very passionate about environmental protection in forests of South America. He wanted to find a way to harvest rubber and latex in a more environmental fashion. She is passionate about women's health and the freedom to be, choose how you want to be sexually reproductive, how many children you want to have, and she's also passionate about the freedom for women in Africa. So their company makes condoms from sustainably sourced rubber and latex without carcinogens, because in case you didn't know, most condoms contain carcinogens. They market them to women to get over the issue of it not being okay for women to carry a pack of three. And they give their profits to charities in the United States who are working with women's freedom and emancipation and to Africa. And I'd like to leave you with three questions that you could take into work tomorrow or whenever you next go for a job interview that you can ask people. Number one, how can we redesign for autonomy and creativity? How can we redesign our management systems, take out management and give us more freedom and autonomy? How can you help me be a more conscious person? How can you help me be a better human? And how can we activate the UN Sustainable Development Goals and have a planetary purpose? I really do believe that every single business can take part in this generational challenge that we face. And it's really only up to each of you as an individual in the companies you either own or work for to make that choice too. Thank you. <laughs>